Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to, to thank the school organizers to count on me to talk about the, um, the optical spectroscopy in the realm of high pressure science. Uh, well, I hope that this talk, as well as the rest of the talks of, of the school, can serve you to, to well, or provide you, give you some kind of uh, theoretical and experimental background to, 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 to follow the, the next conference very efficiently, or more efficiently. Well, concerning this topic, um, I will try to convince you at the end of, of, of the topic that besides electronic structure or optical related uh, phenomena, optical spectroscopy can be a very suitable technique to uh, extract or that may provide um, a structural information. And in some high pressure experiments, optical spectroscopy may provide you inform uh, structural information which presently cannot be achieved through a standard diffraction techniques. Well, I will show some examples which have, has been done in the, in the high pressure in the spectroscopy group of the University of Cantabria. Um, because Cantabria is a small region of Spain, let me present, Cantabria is a small region just in the middle of the Atlantic coast, northern Spain. And its capital is Santander, where uh, hosts the main university campus. Here are the faculties of the main campus, which is surrounding but this big park, and not far are the beaches. It's very interesting for those who, who, who like to, to practice surfing. Uh, well, the scheme of the talk is the following. First, I will, I will introduce the optical spectroscopy. And then uh, why we use high pressure uh, optical spectroscopy. Uh, what and how we can measure, mainly using diamond ambient cells. And I will give you some recommendations to do, well, proper experiments according to to my experience, and then I will come and some some application examples, eh? and at the end the final remarks. What is spectroscopy? Well, it means to study the spectrum of light, which is absorbed, emitted, or scattered by matter as a consequence of the radiation matter interaction processes. We use spectroscopy to probe a sample yes, using the, a beam of, let's say, electromagnetic radiation, and in my case, light. I, I, I will speak about a, a wavelength range for the UV to the near infrared, more or less. And what we can measure is just the attenuation of a beam passing through the sample the, as a function of the wavelength and also maybe for different polarizations. We refer to as absorption spectrum. And we can detect also this emitted or scattered intensity. And we measure the intensity of light as a function of the wavelength for a fixed excitation wavelength. This is called an emission spectrum. Or we can fix the emission wavelength and measure the intensity as a function of the excitation wavelength. This is called excitation spectrum. And there are only two ways. We can use a continuous intensity for doing that, or we can use modulated or pulsed light. In that case, we can play with time. So we, we can excite and we can detect this, this uh, emitted light uh, after given time, after some delay, after the excitation, and this yields to uh, time-resolved spectroscopy. This is very interesting. I would like to mention the usual magnitudes we use in, 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 in absorption spectroscopy. Here is the optical density, is defined in that way. Well, in, in absorption, we use logarithmic scale. I will, I, I will explain why afterwards. But this is a decimal logarithm, okay? And this is something which is, can be obtained directly from the experiment. And usually, we need to know the absorption coefficient, which is given by this formula, is given in terms 
of the thickness. So this is something characteristic of a sample. But the, the ideal magnitude is this one, the absorption cross-section. Absorption cross-section is the absorption coefficient divided by the concentration of absorbing atoms. And usually it's given in, 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 in centimeter, in square centimeters. This magnitude is important because if you know that, for instance, for, let's say, the ruby, if you know a ruby, it's, you don't know the concentration, if you know that, you can determine the concentration of a, of a ruby. Yeah? Okay? Uh, the, concent the chromium concentration in, in, in a ruby. Okay. We are interested in just the absorption and emission processes associated to uh, transitions between states of matter. Okay, so the information we can obtain is this energy difference and also the transition probability. Depending on the, on the range of the, of the electromagnetic uh, radiation, we can, we can have very, very different types of uh, spectroscopy. Depending you use X-ray or uh, uh, radio frequency, etc. Here are some acronyms just to define these this different types of spectroscopy. Let me remind very briefly that optical spectroscopy has been a key technique for the development of, of quantum mechanics as an adequate theoretical framework to explain the dynamics of electrons and atoms in, in, in matter. But optical spectroscopy is, is, is very important also in, in, in condensed matter, in solid state, because we can, we can start a lot of information about the structure of, 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 the, of the matter. Also for applications it's important here, you have some fields where optical spectroscopy is crucial. And nowadays I think optical spectroscopy is important because it provides high resolution high sensitivity detectors, and also the possibility of time-dependent studies. So that means excited state dynamics and so on. It's very easy to adapt to different uh, sample environments. Let's say to working with electric fields, magnetic fields, uniaxial stress, uh, high pressure, etc., And can be applied to almost any material. I mean insulating, semiconductor, even metals, nanoparticles in different types, etc. Here is the magic triangle, uh, which more or less we must follow in, in a spectroscopy. We, we do experiments in a spectroscopy. We try to, to, to establish relationship with the relationships with the structure, and then just models just to explain all these things. This is called correlations and are very important, for instance, for optical spectroscopy to get information, for instance, about the structure of the, of the material. Okay, here, let me put some, some example with this compound. This is a fluoride of thallium and manganese. The manganese is manganese 3 plus. It's not 2 plus. It's the usual, it's more usual, but in that case, it's manganese 3 plus. It's a very strong and agent and form this one-dimensional system. It's antiferromagnetic. It shows uh, well, decreasing, strong decreasing, depending on the, on, the, on the polarization of the light beam along this direction or this direction. And this is the optical absorption spectra. It's very important to know how is the, we can obtain information about the absorption coefficient here, the transition energies associated with the different transitions. And from that, we can extract information about that. That's the... the, the, the the way of working in, in a spectroscopy. For instance, one of the difference between solid state spectroscopy and, and atomic spectroscopy is the line width. Here you are, something, the mercury line, very narrow, something like 0 0.1 centimeters, minus one, and here you have the previous spectrum and the, the bands are very broad, but sometimes the possibility of, of doing low temperature Spectroscopy gives rise to some structure, okay? Some fine structure, which is 
can give you additional information. This is an example just to, to illustrate how it works. Optical spectroscopy. Here you have some narrow lines in the excited uh, in absorption where these differences give you information on the vibrational energies phonons but in the excited state and not in the ground state that you measure like with Raman and other techniques. That's important. Optical spectroscopy allows you to measure not only vibrational properties of the ground state but also in the excited state. And these differences, well, this fine structure arises as a consequence of electron, electron phonon couplings, or in that case, electron phonon and electron uh, magnon interaction. This is a particular case. And what, what's important is this energy, which gives you the energy of a phonon, is measured for the first harmonic. Uh, for the first, uh, harmonic and the second harmonic, and these differences are relative decreasing. Therefore, you can extract not only information of the excited, of the vibrational energy of the excited state, but also about unharmonicity. Well, and because the magnetic origin of this line, the intensity of this line decreases, and goes down, goes to zero at the nearest temperature. So this is a very easy way to explore magnetic properties just from optical spectroscopy. Definition of, let me define now what is the absorption coefficient. It's represented by alpha, and it appears uh, like the proportionality constant, which is defined by the intensity which is absorbed in a thin slice of a sample, which is proportional to the thickness, here you see it, the intensity at that point and the proportionality constant is just the absorption coefficient. The integration of this differential equation gives rise to this well-known law, which is the Lambert B law that gives you the transmitted intensity as a function of the incoming intensity. Here is the connection with the absorption coefficient in terms of the complex refractive index. It's useful to know these relationships, I mean the absorption coefficient, in terms of the imaginary part of the complex refractive index and their reflectivity as a function of the real part and the, and the, and the imaginary part. This is because many papers people used to, 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 to give the complex refractive index, mainly working with metals, and sometimes with the absorption coefficient. It's necessary to know these relationships. From a microscopic point of view, and this is the connection with the structure of matter, we can uh, microscop uh, microscopically determine the absorption coefficient from the transition probability for it between two states A and B using the fermi golden rules. At the end, I summarize. Well, this probability is connected with this matrix element which connected the initial state, the final state, through the radiation matter interaction which for this for most of of of, of, of spectra is of the type of the electric dipole interaction, maybe also magnetic dipole in other terms. Yeah? But I will concentrate that. So if we know or through the absorption coefficient, we can extract information on the symmetry characteristics of the initial and final states. So, the information are three, I would say. First, the structure, I mean the, the, the energy levels of matter. Second, the band shape. And third, the transition probability in terms of the well-known transition oscillator strength. This is the three main characteristics we can obtain from optical spectroscopy. Now, high pressure. Optical spectroscopy in high pressure has two main difficulties, mainly because optical spectroscopy is a technique which can be used at home laboratories. So, uh, a small laboratories has to be really well prepared to do this, this kind of measurements. And we have one problem is the size of the, of the sample, usually between, let's say, 20 and, and 100 microns, 
of the sample, and then the diamond anvil cell, the size of the diamond anvil cell, the mates, the working distance. So we have to use long working distance objectives when we use microscopes. The working of the diamond anvil cell is well known, probably you know, two diamond anvils compressed a hydrostatic cavity with two samples, and then you can get pressure of several megabars depending on the on the um, on the diamond anvil you use. What makes optical spectroscopy a powerful tool for high pressure science is the transparency of diamonds or sapphire or moissanite depending on which anvil you use. This is the the, the crucial point. You can have visual uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, direct visual uh, access to the sample subjected to high pressure. And then you can use light to probe the sample. That's with, with optical spectroscopy. But this is important point, the transparency of the ambient. In absorption experiments, it's some, some, somewhat more complicated because you need to measure the intensity passing through the sample, outside the sample, in order to get the suitable optical absorption spectra. And these are the typical dimensions eh, of your sample. Uh, an important aspect is the, this is some recommendation, the presentation of the, of the gasket is very crucial and the, and the diamond alignment. You can do that, well, you can do that uh, the, the, the whole mechanically or using sparkling machines. At the end, the important thing is to get something like that. A uh, cavity well centered around the, 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 <coughs> the fingerprint of the, of the, of the, of the diamond anvil. And now the loading. You can either load powder or single crystal to do spectroscopy. Problems associated with uh, presentation is that you have not enough presentation, you, you can have some problems with that. The hydrostatic cavity moves, flows, huh? when, when, when you increase pressure. And, 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 and here is another example in that, in that case is, is not well centered and then upon increasing pressure this is displaced. This is observed with a polarizing microscope. This, uh, I mean shadows, this in, in, in interference pattern gives you a very nice information on this, I mean, on the stress of the diamonds. If the diamonds are not or, or, or but uh, aligned. That, that's in, uh, in interesting. For instance, well, this, is, this has to be avoided in, in, in one of the experiments. That's why it's necessary to be careful. Huh? This is a well center, for instance, uh, uh, diamond anvil cell. But anyway, you see here a pattern, I mean a, a diffraction pattern, which gives information of some biaxial components. It's not completely uniaxial. In this case, this is completely uniaxial. This is a perfect uh, uh, alignment of the, of the gasket. Okay. Uh, Another important aspect is hydrostaticity. Stefan Klotz already spoke about that, but I would like to say that, for instance, if you, if you analyze the width of the ruby lines, in principle, with pressure in pure hydrostatic conditions, the width of the ruby lines must decrease with pressure, decrease. So, the onset, oh, sorry, the onset of the increasing of this, of this wave indicates non-hydrostaticity times in the in the cavity. Well, now we must we we must measure, for instance, an, an absorption spectrum, and we have to measure uh, intensity here through the sample, intensity out of the sample. This can be done in two ways, using double double beam spectrometers or single beam spectrometers. We have developed one double beam spectrometer many years ago just to collect at the same time light passing through the sample and out of the sample. 
And this is very good for dealing with weak absorbing materials. You can measure optical densities of the order of hundreds uh, of optical density. That's very powerful. But it fails if the optical density is greater than one. In that case, it's much better to use the single beam spectrometer. Here is an example of one of the spectrometer, which is under patent. We have developed it in, in our group. It's, an optical, it's based on optical fiber, re reflecting objective. Uh, and the point of this is that it can be attached to any spectrometer which has output, uh, optical fiber out outputs. Uh, but this is, gives you a very, good, it's a very good instrument to do that because you can, you can see the image and you can put the spot of light and, and, and to see directly the, 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 the spectrum. So you, you can simultaneously work with the image and also the spectrum you obtain. And also you, you can measure with the same instrument the, the luminescence of ruby. Here is the one of the first example of optical spectroscopy that provides structural information. For instance, this is a copper molybdate. Copper is copper to plus. And in the low pressure phase, most of the copper are octahedral coordinated. But there is one third of copper which has five-fold coordination, pyramidal coordination. The octahedral are centrosymmetric. The pyramidal are non-centrosymmetric. It has no center of inversion. And when you explore the absorption intensity associated with the DD bands, you see here one single band. And after the phase transition, this intensity is reduced by about one order of magnitude. And this difference explains the, 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 the piezochromism exhibited by the compound. I mean, in the high pressure phase, the low pressure phase is green and then brown and here to here. But you see that in the high pressure phase, all copper becomes octahedral coordinated. I mean, all of them has inversion symmetry. That means that given that DD transitions are allowed in non centrosymmetric complexes but are forbidden in centrosymmetric samples, apart from the transition energies, just the intensity gives you information that you are dealing here with non centrosymmetric copper complexes. And this is a way how optical spectroscopy can directly give evidence of this difference of, of coordination. Uh, can be also applied to the study. This is very common semiconductor. This is the case of zinc telluride. You can study directly. Well, this is a direct gap semiconductor with a gap at I mean condition of 2.24 electron volts. You can distinguish through optical through the spectrum that the gap is a direct gap. And you can measure the variation of the gap with pressure. Eh? It increases the band gap, gap energy, but around 7 GPA, the shape of the spectrum changes completely. And this is associated with the structural phase transition from a Wurzite type a structure to a rock salt structure. And what we deduce directly from here is that there is also a change of electronic structure because change from a direct band, direct band gap to an indirect band gap. Okay, this with the help of ab initio DFT calculations can provide uh, energy dispersion curves which can explain the electronic behavior of this material under pressure. Another recommendation, sometimes you need to work with samples which are very, let's say, hyperreactive or, or the liquid scent or something like that, you need to work in, in inner atmosphere. I mean, let's say argon, nitrogen. I recommend you for loading the sample to work with this kind of plastic glove box that can move from one laboratory to the other. And you can put inside microscopes, etc., very easily. And it's very comfortable to work with that. 
Eh? We do that for the cobalt three fluoride. It's a very hyperreactive sample, which cannot be placed with any liquid because it decomposes and so on. So we, we, we were able to load that yes, using the same compound as, um, <coughs> as pressure transmitting media. Another way to do optical absorption spectroscopy with, with powder, so using, uh, I don't know, uh, nano, nanoparticles or something like that, is to use a double drill gasket. This is a nice example for studying this copper chloride system, which is a kind of layer perovskite. Uh, and with this procedure, you, you load here the sample and here the hydrostatic medium, and you can determine the intensity here and intensity here and obtain this beautiful spectra. Also the charge transfer uh, band gap energy and also the DD transitions associated with the copper. This has been published recently by the Wendy Mouse group at Stanford and, and it's really very, very nice. The problem is, well, this requires more or less mm, large Pallets, and the maximum pressure you can reach is somewhat limited to something about like 20 GPA. Okay. And now, what can we measure uh, with optical spectroscopy? I would like to, to make some, some, some estimations. For instance, let me work with this multiferroic compound. And for instance, I'm interested in now, in, well, the, the, the iron is in the highest spin state, and this is the crystal field splitting, and I would like to know what is the pressure necessary to increase the crystal field 10%. I mean, for instance, from 1.5 electron volt to 1.65 electron volts. What we need is just to know which is the compression we need to increase the crystal field that quantity. And for that, usually we use semi-empirical laws, like, like, like this one, using exponents n equal 5. n equal 5, which is the exponent which provides the crystal field theory, but also has been proved to be right, this exponent for oxides and fluoride. Okay, well, anyway, if you know the dependence of this crystal field with volume, you can, with the bulk powder used to estimate the pressure necessary to increase this crystal field 10%. This is 6 EPA in this compound. But we can go further. And what is the pressure necessary to increase the crystal field in such a way that the highest spin electron configuration is stable in favor of the lowest spin. I mean, if you increase this separation, this, well, the question is, why I put this, this electron here? Because if I try all, all in, the low, in the highest spin, all electrons are unpaired, if I try to put this electron here, it requires uh, the pairing energy. And if we are able to increase the crystal field above the pairing energy, we can stabilize the low spin, uh, the low spin as ground state. This is what is known like a high spin to light spin transition. And what is the pressure required to detect that? Okay, uh, we know that This high spin to low spin transition requires to increase the crystal field 50%, up to 2.3 electron volts. Well, on the, on the basis of this dependence on the crystal field with volume, we need to reduce the volume this quantity. And this applies according to the equation of a state 45 GPA. This is an estimation. High spin, low spin in, 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 in this multiferroic has been measured eh, by X-ray fluorescence and other techniques, and it appears, it occurs at 50 GPA. But it's not a sharp transition. Eh? It has some width starting from 40 GPA more, 50 GPA more. Okay. Last example on absorption. 
<coughs> because this dependence of the crystal field with, with volume with an exponent 5 applies for oxides and fluorides, the question is, does it also apply for more covalent systems like chlorides? We have done a very simple experiment just to take this manganese 2 plus compound in chloride. It is a perovskite structure where the manganese is in octahedral coordination. We can compress the system and to analyze how the crystal field depends on the volume. Well, we do that, that experiment. This is an absorption experiment. Eh? And we, from this spectra, we can obtain the crystal field spreading as a function of pressure and taking into account the equation of state for this compound, we get this exponent, an exponent which is not far from five, but is almost seven. So it's, well, the, 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 the recommendation is be careful when you try to use these estimations always with an exponent n equal 5. It's necessary to make correlations for different materials. And while once this correlation has been established, then from optical spectroscopy you can obtain a structural information. Okay, the final example I want to show is just yes, something related to time resolved high pressure spectroscopy and this is a setup for doing emission and excitation spectroscopy. We use in that case an, an OPPO laser. This is a, a powerful tool because it allows you to tune in a, on an almost continuous way the wavelength from the UV to the infrared. But this is usually very powerful because pulses are nanoseconds time scale. And you have to be very careful to the focus of this laser because otherwise you can do something like that. You can burn eh, the, 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 the diamond, the diamond colored and produce graphite here. Okay? So it's very critical the, the focusing of this of this powerful of this powerful laser. I have two examples of photoluminescent sensors for high pressure spectroscopy, but I, I want to skip that. You have in the, the presentation in, in, in the pen drive you you have, and I would like to pass directly to the following question. Why Ruby is so important as as pressure sensor? Is it the chromium three plus? Is it the aluminium oxide? are both important for, for that and what, what, what I'm going to explain is very important community plus because of the electronic it's electronic structure and also is, is the aluminium oxide but very indirectly because aluminium oxide provides the crystal fill at the aluminium side where the chromium enters which is high enough to produce narrow line emission. Okay? But you can use any other material which provides this crystal field. Let me show. This is two chromium materials. This is ruby, well known, the absorption bands. And this is the luminescence. And this is one uh, fluoro. Perovskite, this is a fluoride of chromium. Okay? This one. This is doped with chromium 3 plus. And chromium 3 plus in these compounds has a broad band luminescence. And in that case, it's a narrow band luminescence, narrow emission lines. Why is that? Well, if you look at the electronic structure of chromium 3 plus, this is the ground state for a 2, and this is the first excited state from which the emission takes place. And this emitting state can be either this one, which is the which is the 42, or this other one. The difference is at this excited state crossover point. 
So fluorite lies in that part, and therefore you have broadband photoluminescence. And uh, ruby is in that part, and therefore is narrow band, narrow line photoluminescence. This is a measure of the crystal field splitting. So if you increase the crystal field splitting, you can transform the luminescence properties of chromium. Well, this has been already shown before by, by, by Stefan Cloth. I would like to say that the R1 and R2 lines can be also measured in absorption. Okay, and, and, and that's important because it gives you the ideal intensity ratio of these two lines. Yes, for instance, to make estimations of temperature from the intensity ratio in the emission in the emission lines. Okay, anyway. The point is you can you can excite these levels, the 42 or the 41, or even this one, and always you obtain photoluminescence for the lowest excited state, which is 2E, the case of chromium 3 plus. And here you are, the here you are the, the photoluminescence and what is important the shift or the pressure shift of these lines is quite uh, small. I mean, 0 0.36, something like that, nanometers per gigapascal. And this contrasts with the 40, 42 and 41 bands which shift in the opposite direction uh, and at the shift of something like 2.7 nanometers per gigapascal. Uh, you see? And that's a problem because if you use a green laser at high pressure, probably you are not able to excite the ruby. That's why Stefan Cloth said that a blue laser is much better because you can excite the ruby during a wide pressure, a wide pressure range. The point is that I, I want to, 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 to show this is the, is the crystal field, the main parameter which determine the luminescence properties of the chromium in aluminium oxide. And I start from this material. This is the lithium calcium aluminium fluoride with chromium 3 plus. This is the absorption spectrum. Well, it is characterized because the first excited state is in that part. Therefore, the luminescence is broad. And what I would like is to put this, I mean to increase the crystal field just to, to put the crystal field in this, in this region. We do that, and we observe, here is the, the sample, and we transform a broad band photoluminescence of chromium 3 plus to a narrow, narrow line luminescence at very high pressure. You see the evolution is not uh, instantaneous because here it appears at intermediate pressure, and the intensity of these narrow lines increases at expenses of this one. They are thermally populated in equilibrium and at very high pressure we can get only narrow line emission because we are able to separate the 42 and 2 levels a lot eh? in order to get only population the two. This is similar to the ruby. So we observe here two the R1 and R2 lines. This is the case of ruby. This is the our case, and the shift is quite similar, even smaller. The shift is 0 0.146 nanometer per gigapascal. But for instance, looking for sensors, this has an advantage, I would say, with respect to, to, to Ruby in the following way. The separation between R1 and R2 lines are higher. Here is about one nanometer, and here is twice. That means that the measure of these two intensities, the ratio of these two intensities, gives you information on the temperature. As well as in Ruby, the ratio of these intensities gives you information on temperature. The problem is the Ruby is very good for temperature below than 150K or something like that. Okay, because at room temperature, almost are equally populated. But if you increase the separation of these two lines, you can well get an additional temperature sensor for temperature about 300K. 
And so, at the same time, you measure the, the, the spectrum and you determine the pressure, you can also determine the temperature. Well, and this is the proof that, well, for, for this kind of emission, is the crystal field the main parameter governing, governing the, the, the photoluminescence properties of the ruby. Well, here is, is time resolved spectroscopy, the lifetime increases when, when at the side the state crossover, and also the excitation spectrum solves the shift of the, of the absorption bands with pressure. It's enormous in that way. Well, these are the conclusions. So I summarize, optical spectroscopy is a useful complementary tool for structural studies of materials under high pressure conditions and also for identifying spin transitions and excited state crossover. Uh, the correlation with studies between crystal structure and electronic structure in terms of picadary allows us to extract structural information from the optical spectrum. This for semiconductors, this for transition metal systems. And also important, the optical absorption experiments in this perovskite show that the crystal field uh, behaves as with the lattice parameter of this formula with exponent which differs from phi. In that case, it's near 7. And finally, the pressure induced excited state crossover in chromium 3 plus fluorides yields luminescence transformation from broad band emission to narrow, narrow line emission. Thanks to the members of my group and also for funding and, and, and collaboration to these institutions. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Yes. And what's so, the question? So how, how big is the effect of different media in optical spectroscopy? Has some well, not so big effect for the practice, but the low Well, the effect of different uh, pressure transmitting media is when you lose hydro pure hydrostaticity. It depends on the pressure transmitting media. I mean, the, the stress distribution can be different. And that affects the gradient of pressure you have inside the, 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 the cavity. That's why it's very important to probe, to probe the sample in different parts in order to get an inform well, to probe the pressure along the cavity chamber and also whether the spectrum in the sample is more or less homo homogeneous. Because in many cases, the absorption spectrum doesn't change when you have some kind of pressure gradient because it's not enough to modify the spectrum, okay? So these things must be, I think, checked by probing the sample in different parts to check also the, the, the pressure distribution within the chamber. But this is for experiments where the pressure transmitting medium is not pure, purely hydrostatic. In thus, in the manganese to plus perovskite, we work under pure hydrostatic conditions because we were always below 5 EPA. Uh, as I understood the previous question, it uh, was concerned about uh, that you sub subtract uh, uh, absorption spectra from media, from, uh, yes. from the signal from, uh, from the sample. sample. Mm. And in this case, different media should give uh, a di uh, uh -huh. different result. I would say no because you do this you do these two measurements just to compensate. Okay? There is a small difference is the amount of sample which is occupied by the sample. Yeah, you cannot compensate that. But there are I mean you can also uh, do some manipulation with the I and I zero in order to compensate completely. Okay? Yes, it's, it's right. But the, in, in general, no, because uh, 
the sample can be 20 microns, then 10 microns. Yes, probably you have some different thickness. I mean, for the transmitting of the of the of light in the in the hydrostatic uh, pressure transmitting medium, when you well, yes, of course, but you can compensate. In general, this is not the case because pressure transmitting media are transparent in the range where we work, so does not affect too much for that. Yes. You mean for absorption measurements to measure I and I zero, if it is important or or, or not? I, I I would well, I would say you if you are measuring optical densities below zero point one, I would say yes, it's very important to compensate. If the, if the optical density is greater than 0 0.1, okay, you can, you can use a previous, uh, well, it's, it's important always to, to, to check the, 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 the spectrum of the light you, you are using, but it's not very crucial just to compensate for diamonds or hydrostatic medium because the, the variations of, 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 of absorption are not enough if the absorption of the sample is high enough.